This week on the Lectures in History podcast, University of Kentucky English professor Peter Collini discusses how Cold War politics shaped literature from Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. I'm Juan, and I'm part of the team that produces C-SPAN podcasts. As a listener, you can help us continue to produce our quality podcasts about history, books, and current events with a tax-deductible contribution to C-SPAN's nonprofit operations. Visit cspan.org slash donate to learn more. Thanks for listening. Thank you and welcome. I'm going to be talking to you about my book today, uh, The Aesthetic Cold War, Decolonization and Global Literature. I want to thank the Commonwealth Institute of Black Studies for making this event possible today. Um, My project is about the effect of the Cold War especially the effect of the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union on the literatures and the intellectual development of writing in the decolonizing world. What was then called the third world is now called sometimes the developing world or the global south. So there have been lots of studies of Cold War literature. Most of them have focused on what happened in the United States and the Soviet Union, but as I started to do my research on this project, I learned that the U.S. and Soviet Union and the competition between them had an incredible effect on literary development in other parts of the world, especially Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, which were the focus of this book. Now, instead of offering a sort of general overview and thematic overview, instead of reading novels, poetry, and plays, and thinking about what is the effect of ideological competition, Cold War competition in places in the global south, I decided in this book that I wanted to focus on two of the mechanisms in which large states got involved directly in literary competition in the global south. The first of those areas is in what I call Cold War cultural diplomacy. The United States and Soviet Union sponsored libraries, they sponsored music tours, they sponsored cultural events, they sponsored museums, they sponsored book publication schemes and book distribution schemes, they sponsored international conferences, Most of all, and what I talk about at great length in this book, is their sponsorship of magazines that targeted writers and targeted audiences in what's now called the Global South. This is a a, a brief snippet of some of the magazines that I look at in this project. If you look at the, the top left of this slide, you'll see Black Orpheus. This is a magazine that was founded in Ibadan, Nigeria in the 1950s, and it was ultimately sponsored by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which we learned in 1966 to 1967 was a CIA front. <laughs> Below that, on the left, is Transition Magazine, the editor of which was Rajat Niyoji, a Ugandan Indian. Um, This is probably the best known of the literary and political magazines that came out of Africa during the 60s. Some of you may know it because this magazine was revived by uh, Henry Louis Gates at Harvard, and it's still running now. So if you look up on Project Muse or whoever it is that, that, that carries the magazine, you can find Uh, editions of Transition going all the way back to the first one in 1961 or thereabouts to, to, to the magazine's current day operations, also sponsored by the CIA covertly, Congress for Cultural Freedom. And I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. In the bottom left of this slide, you'll see another Congress for Cultural Freedom magazine. They were a big operation in the 1960s. This was Encounter, which was based in London. The primary audiences were Anglo-American, but it had a huge impact on literary developments in Africa. Top left of that slide, you'll see one of the many magazines sponsored by the U.S. State Department called World Today. This was produced out of Hong Kong and distributed throughout the Chinese diaspora in the 50s and 60s. Um, 
the, 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 the writer that I talk about that, that published some of her most interesting stuff in World Today is Eileen Chang, um, who, who left China in the 1950s and ultimately resettled in the United States. The last magazine that I'll point out to you on this slide, probably the most successful and certainly the most durable of these magazines was Lotus, Afro-Asian Writings. This was sponsored by the Soviet Union throughout its period, its, uh, its full print run. Um, so you can see that magazines were one area of competition between the US and Soviet Union. One of the things that I'll point, about, point out about Lotus that was unusual was also a trilingual magazine. It was pu published simultaneously in Arabic, in English, and in French. And it had a circulation that ranged between five and 10,000 magazines per issue. It was published out of Cairo um, by, the, by the Minister of Culture, Yusuf El Sabai was the editor. So cultural diplomacy, I'll talk a lot more about that in this talk, but this gives you a quick overview of some of the, the forms of competition that took place in the world of publishing arts and letters between the US and Soviet Union in the decolonizing world. The other part of this project, if the cultural diplomacy part of the project we might think of as the carrot that was dangled in front of African and Asian writers was the stick, right? Uh, the US and Soviet Union both tried to influence the development in, of arts and letters in the decolonizing world through state intervention, intelligence agencies, putting writers in jail, deporting them, censoring their work, depriving them of citizenship, and opening up monitoring and intelligence files on those writers, some for decades, right? And these are just some of the writers that I talk about in this project. There were a wide range of writers from what's now called the Global South that were spied upon by one or more governments. And if you read the book, you'll see that actually a lot of these writers show up in both parts of the narrative that I tell, right? These are writers who enjoyed state patronage in certain contexts and then were the, the people who were punished by large states in other contexts. Um, you can see on this slide two of Africa's Nobel laureates. There aren't that many of them, right? Uh, Vole Shoyinka on the left who wrote a great, uh, amazing prison memoir, The Man Died, that I talk about extensively in the book, um, he spent uh, almost two years in, in solitary, well, not all of it in solitary, but a significant part of it in solitary detention in Nigeria. Doris Lessing, another Nobel laureate from Africa, was spied upon by MI5 for nearly two decades, and she knew it. She talked about it extensively in her writing. She was aware of it, and they made sure that she knew she was a under observation. Um, Alex Laguma, the figure in the center, was exiled from South Africa. He spent the better part of 10 years either in jail or under house arrest. He was harassed by the intelligence services for much of his adult life while he was living in South Africa. Uh, Nawal El Sadawi, the great Egyptian medical doctor and feminist activist spent time in an Egyptian prison. She also wrote about her experiences, as did Ngugi Wa Thiongo, the great Kenyan writer, um, who spent time about a year in detention in Kenya. The bottom right of this slide, Claudia Jones and CLR James. I'll talk about them a little bit later in my discussion. They're both from the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean. They both spent time in England as well as in the United States. They were both deported from the United States. Both have very extensive FBI files that I looked at and somewhat more slender but substantial MI5 files that were collected on them during their time in England. Um, the bottom center, you'll note uh, Mulk Rajanan, the great Indian writer. He's pictured here at the 1958 Tashkent meeting of the Afro-Asian Writers Association. Um, next to him is W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American 
uh, political theorist and, and, and writer who was denied a passport for many years in the United States. Um, his passport was reinstated, interestingly enough, in time for him to attend the first meeting of the Afro-Asian Writers Association. This is the group that sponsors the Lotus magazine. Their first meeting was in Tashkent in the Soviet Union in 1958, and Du Bois was there. Rajat Nyoji, the editor of Transition, he also spent time in detention in Uganda before coming to the U.S. Sajad Zahir, uh, the Indian and Pakistani writer and intellectual, and and uh, Mulk Rajanand, these are two of the earliest figures who show up in the intelligence files that I examined. They were being tracked by British and Indian security services during the colonial period well back into the 1930s. So monitoring of writers is something that happened over a very extensive period of time. Many writers had dealings with state agencies um, through cultural diplomacy efforts, but many of these same writers were the victim, if you like, of state apparatuses that tracked their movements, monitored their work. So let me turn now, tell you a little bit more about what I do with cultural diplomacy in this project. And I'll start that by giving you a, a little bit of an anecdote about how I got started on this research. In the early 2000s, between about 2005 and 2010, I was working on a book project that had to do primarily with connections between white metropolitan British writers and their counterparts from the decolonizing world. And I was especially interested in a BBC radio program called Caribbean Voices that hosted black and other writers of color from the Caribbean alongside some of their white British counterparts. And I was at the Harry Ransom Center in Texas doing some archival research for this project. And whenever I go do archival work, I like to describe what I'm doing to the librarians and archivists because they always know stuff. They know stuff that I don't know and they know way more about their own holdings than I do. So I was describing my work on my interest in BBC radio to an archivist and she said to me, okay, you gotta talk to one of my colleagues, this guy called Bob Taylor. She made an appointment with me to meet with him the next day. I show up to the meeting, and Bob sits me down and says, have you heard of the Transcription Center? I heard that you're doing this work on BBC Radio and this program called Caribbean Voices. Have you heard of the Transcription Center? I said, not ringing any bells, man. I don't know. I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, okay, well, during the 1960s in London, there was this ex-BBC radio producer called Dennis Durden, who had a recording studio, and he invented this thing or started this thing called the Transcription Center, and they brought in all of the emerging African writing talent of the 1960s when they passed through London. So they did interviews with Vole Shoyinka and Louis Nkosi and Ezekiel Palele, Chinua Achebe, the whole Alex Laguma, the whole 1960s generation of writers. I said, Boy, that sounds really fascinating. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out as soon as I'm done writing this 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 other book that I'm working on. <laughs> and he said, okay, just wanted to make sure you're aware of it. We've got all the stuff here at the Harry Ransom Center, and we were sort of getting up to lead, and he sort of said with a twinkle in his eye, he said, Oh, and I almost forgot to tell you. And I said, Oh. He said, the transcription center was covertly funded by the CIA. <laughs> Now he had my attention. I said, what on earth was the CIA in 1962, 63, supporting an outfit that was recording programs with Vole Shoyinka and other luminaries from that generation and distributing them around the world? I just, it didn't make any sense to me. And he said, that's where my job ends and your job begins, right? <laughs> you need to find out what the CIA was doing backing a program like this, and you need to make that story known. So that's kind of how my research started. 
Um, I pulled some files that very afternoon. This was a, 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 an archive that had been acquired by the Harry Ransom Center, but it hadn't even been cataloged yet. So I just said, you know, bring me some boxes. And I started looking. This document is one of the earliest, box, uh, earliest documents that I found in my searches. This is a program from the 1962, it's called the Imbari Conference, but it was also called the African Writers of English Expression Conference at Makrere University in Kampala, Uganda. And it's got a list of participants. I'll enlarge this in a second to show you some of the major figures who were at this conference. So I knew the first time I saw this roster of attendees that these are all people who had accepted money, at least indirectly, from the CIA. Interesting. Now, when this conference happened, I should point out that CIA sponsorship was covert. They did not say, hey, the CIA is sponsoring it. It was sponsored by an organization called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. But I should point out that the Congress for Cultural Freedom made absolutely no bones about its ideological orientation. Right? In their manifesto, which was published in 1950, they say things like totalitarianism of the kind practiced by the Soviet Union is the, is the greatest threat to mankind since the Stone Age, for instance. Perhaps exaggerated. But my point is that the ideological orientation of the Congress for Cultural Freedom was no secret, even if the funding was secret. Here's a, a, a blow up. I don't know how well you'll be able to read it, so I highlighted a few names of figures who showed up at the 1962 conference. There's one in the bottom corner there, Ralph Ellison, the great African-American novelist and essayist. We don't think he actually attended the conference, but he was invited. He was on the program. He may have run into travel complications. I don't know. But if you look at the rest of this document, especially the top half of it, you'll see that the whole generation of 1960s Anglophone writers is there from Chinua Achebe, Dennis Durden, the guy who directed the transcription center that I talked about a moment ago, was there. Alex Laguma, whom I'll talk about in a moment, was fresh off the publication of A Walk in the Night. Um, he, was, he, was, he was invited also another no-show, because he was in detention. The South African authorities would not let him leave the country. Christopher Okibo, the great Nigerian poet who sadly died in the Civil War in Nigeria a few years later, was there. Louis Nkosi, Ngugi Wa Tiongo, he was known as James Ngugi, was there. Ezekiel, or Eskia Mpalele, uh, the great South African writer, was in many ways the de facto host of the event. He uh, was the brainchild of it. He was working for the Congress for Cultural Freedom at this time. V.S. Naipaul happened to be doing a fellowship in East Africa at the time, and he was there, as was Langston Hughes, who was kind of the presiding luminary, um, the guest of honor at the, at the conference. So when I saw this document, a narrative, and again, this is very early on in my, research, in my research, a narrative started to form in my mind, right? Okay, what we have here in front of us, or in front of me at that time, is a, is a kind of stable of writers who had taken patronage from an anti-totalitarian organization and we can already see writers lining up and taking sides in this Cold War. At least this is what I thought I saw when I saw this document. Here's a picture of Chinua Achebe at that 1962 conference. And I'm, I'm already forming in my mind this group of writers who became partisans of the US and advocates of some kind of anti-totalitarian agenda should point out briefly while I'm on this slide, Congress for Cultural Freedom was unmasked as a, as a, as a CIA-backed organization in 1966-67. It was started in 49-50, aftermath of World War II, and ran until about 1967. And they were extremely active throughout the decolonizing world. So there's Achebe and a bunch of other people that I won't mention here at that conference. And then, a couple years later, I started turning my attention to the Afro-Asian Writers Association, the counterpart 
of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the competing organization of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Their magazine was called Lotus. The prize they awarded, the the grand prize that they awarded to literary figures was the Lotus Prize. And here you can see Chinua Achebe was awarded the Lotus Prize. And I thought, like all scholars do, interesting. (laughs) (laughs) This is an anomaly, right? And I'm going to put brackets around it, and I'm going to put it... I'm going to put it over here. I'm going to deal with it later. I'm not going to, like, suppress it, because that would be, you know, something you don't want to do. But humanists, we love anomalies. We love interesting, weird facts, right? This is one of them. I'll deal with it later. Alex Laguma, the great South African writer who could not attend the 1962 Makerere Conference, was nevertheless an important figure there. His, his first novella, A Walk in the Night, had recently been published by Imbari Publishers. That was a publishing outfit that was started in Ibadan, Nigeria, and it was closely affiliated with the Congress for Cultural Freedom. They took Congress for Cultural Freedom money, and A Walk in the Night was the centerpiece at the 1962 Macrere Conference of the fiction discussions. They broke the conference up into some fiction panels, some poetry panels, and some drama panels. And A Walk in the Night, Laguma's book, even though he couldn't be there, was the centerpiece of those discussions. Fast forward to 1973, and here you'll see a picture of Alex Laguma at the Soviet-affiliated Afro-Asian Writers Association meeting. Um, He's actually awarded the Lotus Prize, one of the first Lotus Prizes, in 1969. Um, He's here. He looks like he's strangling uh, Keteb Yassin, the great French Algerian writer, but he's actually congratulating Keteb Yassin on his own Lotus Prize. This is Yusuf El Sabai, the Egyptian writer and minister of culture during the the 70s, um, during Sadat's regime. Um, uh, Yusuf El Sabai was the founding editor of Lotus Magazine. Uh, Alex Laguma went on to edit the magazine for a time, and he also became the general secretary of the Afro-Asian Writers Association. So the chief executive, if you like, of the Afro-Asian Writers Association. So the, the brackets that I had pushed way over here are now kind of sitting on my shoulder a little bit. Right? Chinua Chebe is shown up as a figure at both events. Alex Laguma has shown up as a figure at US sponsored events and Soviet sponsored events. I'm starting to think, okay, this is more than an anomaly. I might need to deal with it. Um, this is a picture of Semben Usman, the great Senegalese novelist and filmmaker. I've never, I don't know if anybody else has, but I've never seen a picture of him without a pipe. You let me know if you find one. But if you ever see a, 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 a photograph of a Senegalese guy in you know, traditional dress, we might call it smoking a pipe, chances are it's Semben Usman, right? Here he is at the very first meeting of the Afro-Asian Writers Association in 1958 in Tashkent, which is then part of the, the Soviet Union. Here he is at the French language equivalent of the Makerere conference that is hosted on his home turf in Dakar, Senegal. So this is a Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, event that he attended just a few years after the Tashkent event. Here he is smoking his pipe. And here he is, 1973, accepting his own Lotus Award at the Afro-Asian Writers Association meeting. In the middle is a Vietnamese poet, Thu Bon, and over here is a young-ish Ngugiwa Tiongo. We don't have a picture of him at the 1962 Macrere conference, or at least I couldn't find a picture of him there. Also somebody who attended the Soviet-affiliated Afro-Asian Writers Association meetings. So this weight over here is now like a millstone around my neck, and I'm in a blind panic thinking the whole premise with which I started at least half of this book is now shot to pieces. 
what am I going to do? Here's the great Ghanaian po- uh, a playwright, Efwa Sutherland, at the first 1958 Afro-Asian Writers Association meeting. Um, in the audience there is W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who was, you know, just as Langston Hughes had kind of presided over the Macrere event, W.E.B. Du Bois was at the, the Tashkent event. Um, F. W. Sutherland is somebody like Semben, like Laguma, was going back and forth between Congress for Cultural Freedom and Afro-Asian Writers Association events. This is a an abbreviated list of some of the major figures in African literature from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that went back and forth and had various levels of involvement and engagement with both the United States-affiliated cultural diplomacy apparatus and its Soviet counterpart, Lotus Magazine and the Afro-Asian Writers Association. Most of these writers published in at least one Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, publication as well as some of those um, Lotus Magazine issues that I talked about a few moments ago. So as I was churning through this information, one of the most difficult things for me to do writing this book was to account for this, but it was also one of the most liberating parts of doing this project was trying to reckon with this archival, and I'll call it empirical data, that I found as I was doing my research. Um, My original hypothesis was completely sunk, but one of the things that I discovered is that it became possible to rethink this moment, not as a moment when writers from the decolonizing parts of the world were declaring their allegiances and lining up neatly in one camp or another through systems of patronage and cultural diplomacy. But in fact, I make the argument in the first half of this book that this was a moment when a very savvy and canny group of writers were willing to play both sides of this equation. They were willing to seek patronage and opportunities to publish their work in both the Soviet Union and its affiliates, as well as in the United States and and its affiliates. And as you can see here, I, I argue that in contrast to the people, and there are a few of them out there, scholars who argue that Cold War sponsorship of writers from Africa and Asia effectively defanged anti-colonial writing. I argue in my book that vibrant and competing cultural diplomacy networks led by the US and Soviet Union allowed for at least a brief period savvy Global South writers to work across and between camps, carving out a space for indigenous writing, for themselves, and for anti-colonial resistance in their work. You have two superpowers down on bended knee asking for the favors of Global South writers, and they knew how to work the system, and I argue that they did that very effectively, at least for a brief period of time, the 20 or so years after World War II. So now I want to talk a little bit about the other half of this project, Um, maybe the less fun half, but nevertheless um, an interesting part of this project. We all know that writers faced significant sanctions. Um, Some of those were dissident writers who were not afraid to speak truth to power and suffered the consequences for it. Some of them were apolitical or non-political writers that various states deemed dangerous for one reason or another. One of the points that I make in this book is that state surveillance of writers was ubiquitous during this period. There is not a national government or an international superpower during this period of time that did not collect intelligence on writers. It happened in the United States, and African American and queer writers, as we know, were overwhelmingly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly, the targets of that surveillance. It's an old story in the Soviet Union and perhaps an overplayed story because the Soviet Union were not the only nation during this time that were sanctioning writers, right? And it certainly happened in the independent states of the post-colonial world in Africa and Asia and elsewhere. 
all states collected intelligence on writers. All states bullied writers that they found to be unsatisfactory, dangerous, or problematic for one reason or another. So I want to talk with you today, give you sort of one case study briefly from the book that um, deals with Claudia Jones and C.L.R. James, the great Trinidadian intellectuals. On this slide, I give you a sort of brief overview of Claudia Jones's biography. She's born in Trinidad in 1915. I think C.L.R. James is born in 1901. So they're not quite contemporaries, but they're close. Um, She comes to the U.S. as a child and goes to New York City. In 1936, so as a fairly young woman, she joins the Communist Party. It's not until 1942, actually, that the FBI file opens. And when the FBI file opens, um, it really opens wide, right? The Claudia Jones dossier is over 1,000 pages in length. Um, about 800 pages of which are now available. Certain parts of the file still remain under wraps, redacted, not available to the public um, for reasons that I don't know and can't fully explain. Um, But it's not until 1942 that they begin tracking her. Uh, For about 100 pages of the file, um, they think she's born in Virginia or somewhere in the U.S., and it's not until much later in the file that she, they, they, they figure out that she, she, she migrated to the U.S. as a young person. In 1950, she's detained for a short period on Ellis Island, where C.L.R. James is also going to be detained. She spends 11 months in prison, not all that far from here, in West Virginia, with a number of other communist activists. Um, because she was uh, not born in the U.S., they also had the government also had the ability to deport her. They did that after she was released from prison, um, after serving her roughly 11 months of prison. And at that time, she went back to not back to England. She went to England for the first time and lived much of the rest of her life in England, where the MI5, which is the, the sort of domestic security apparatus in the United Kingdom also tracked her, um, although that file has either been lost or suppressed. I was not able to see it. Some interesting features about Claudia Jones's file that I want to mention to you. So this is a, a document taken from her file. When I first got my hands on that file, I expected to see some really interesting stuff. I expected to see wiretaps. I I expected to see all kinds of secret agents um, alluded to. Um, I expected to see um, all kinds of covert operations of one kind or another. Um, I was, I don't want to say disappointed, but surprised when I read her file. It is kind of a boring slog. There's a thousand pages of it, and a lot of it is boring, but that got me interested. That, that, the, 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 the quotidian nature of it and the, the sort of reporting structure that the FBI used to keep track of what Claudia Jones became really interesting to me. So this is one of the documents taken from Claudia Jones's file. There are these long documents within the file that are called prosecutive summaries. And the FBI was assembling these from the very earliest stages of tracking Claudia Jones. And what these were were a kind of game plan, right? How do we convict this person? This is the information that we give to a prosecutor. So the FBI is there to investigate, not actually to prosecute. They're going to hand that material off to a prosecutor. And what they do when they're tracking somebody and want to potentially have them prosecuted for a crime is they assemble a, assemble a game plan called a prosecutive summary. Some of these in Claudia Jones's file are huge. The largest one is 111 pages long, this game plan for how are we going to get Claudia Jones from the perspective of the government. But these documents were fascinating in and of themselves. Here is a document taken from one of them. 
the star witness is not going to be some kind of secret informant that had infiltrated Claudia Jones's circle. It's not going to be an intelligence expert who's been tapping her phones. It is going to be the head librarian of the New York Public Library and the librarian of Congress. And their exhibits are going to be documents from the Daily Worker, other newspapers and magazines where Claudia Jones had published her work. This, to me, was fascinating. The main bit of evidence for Claudia Jones and against Claudia Jones was presented by librarians. And the main evidence against her was things that she'd written. Things that today would be legal, things that then were probably legal, and yet. So it's interesting. I had a vision of intelligence agents doing one thing, but the more and more I sat with these files, the more the intelligence agents that the FBI used to track Claudia Jones, and as I'll show in a moment, CLR James, they did the kind of work that I do, and that librarians do, and that archivists do. They read a lot of stuff. They clip out little things from newspapers. I mean, this is pre-internet days, right? So they're not using their Google box to, to search up everything, right? They're taking clippings from newspapers. They're reading stuff. They're attending rallies, taking notes on what people say in their speeches, just like a few of you are today, right? Everything that I do, interpret, interpret texts, right? That's as a, as, a, as a professor of English and somebody who's got a strong interest in history, that's what I do. That's what I spend most of my day doing. It's exactly what the FBI agents were doing as they developed a case against Claudia Jones. So I'll wrap things up by turning to CLR James. He, like Claudia Jones, is born in Trinidad. Unlike her, he goes, when he leaves Trinidad, he goes to England first. He spends about six or seven years there and publishes a number of books and also reports on the great game of cricket for the Manchester Guardian um, before going to the United States just as he was publishing his great history of the Haitian Revolution, the Black Jacobins. He goes to the U.S. to go on a lecture tour in 1939 and war breaks out while he's in the U.S., And he ends up staying for about 15 years in the U.S. before he is detained on Ellis Island, just like Claudia Jones, and eventually deported, at which point he goes back to England. And unlike Claudia Jones, we have CLR James's MI5 file to compare to his FBI file. Now, I should point out that CLR James was ultimately deported for overstaying his visa, but it's not like he was living in hiding during this time. Um, He got divorced. He married a a U.S. uh, citizen during this period. Um, I believe that he also registered for selective service for the draft um, during this period, although I haven't been able to, to, to fully confirm that. There's a stray note that I found in his archive to that effect. So he was hardly living in hiding during this period. The F, the F, the, sorry, MI5 had been tracking him while he was in, in England in the 1930s. FBI gets on his trail in 1947. He's deported in 1952, and MI5 picks up the file uh, from there. This is one of the earliest documents that I found in CLR James's file. Um, I'll show you a blow-up of it here. This is one of the earliest, earliest reports um, describing CLR James, and right from the earliest reports on James, the agent says, we're going to deport this guy. We're, we are going to get him out of our country as an alien subversive. So the FBI, although it sometimes took years for them to produce a case, they didn't fool around, especially with aliens of color. Right? Their goal was to prosecute and get them out of the country more or less as quickly as possible. And it's evidence in Jones's file from the very beginning as well as from CLR James's file. Now, 
This was an interesting little tidbit that sort of backs up some of what I was saying about Claudia Jones. This is taken from the prosecution of CLR James. He actually fought his deportation in court. And one of the arguments that CLR James made in court to the judge is, hey, listen, I'm interested in Marxism. He was a Trotskyite, by the way. So he and Claudia Jones, who was a, a, a card-carrying member of the, of, the, of the Communist Party, did not see eye to eye, right? For Claudia Jones, somebody like CLR James is an apostate, right? Um, so James in court said, hey, like, don't, don't get too upset. I'm a writer. Like, don't, don't deport me. I'm not planning or plotting to overthrow the government. I'm not sparking a seditious movement. I, I'm a writer. Just, you know, t- take it easy. And here's, here's what the prosecution says in response to him. James's representatives, his attorneys, claim that the respondent is not an actionist, revolutionary, merely a writer and philosopher. It is our impression that the world revolutionary movement has been founded and led by writers, Engels, whose name they misspelled, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, and others. The books the respondent admits, admits to have written or worked on are World Revolution, The History of the Negro Revolution from 1700 to 1937, Black Jacobins, a work not yet published at the time of the hearings on Herman Melville, which would become Mariners, renegades, and castaways. So this is, this is an interesting moment where James says, hey, I'm just a writer. Writers aren't really that dangerous, right? And the U.S. says, darn right you're a writer, and your kind are the most dangerous people that we have. Um, so if, you know, if in our own moment there are times when those of us who are interested in writing and ideas feel like a wider public doesn't take notice, this was a time when people paid attention to what writers had to say at the, at the, very, at the very least. This, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, just in the process of wrapping up here, is another document that I just, I, I, the, the geek in me had to show you this document, right? Um, it's all redactions, right? All these, all these black markered spots are redactions. There's a little bit here, hard to read, says England, right? Which gives us a sense that MI5 and FBI are collaborating and sharing intelligence, and they're not the only ones. But what was interesting is that uh, CLR James was involved with a very small Trotskyite organization at this time that was based in the Detroit area, and what I speculate is that these names are all redacted because they're secret informants, right? And one of the things that I sort of imagine when I see a document like this, it's impossible to know, at least in, based on the information that I have, is that James is there legitimately, right? Everybody else is gathering information, right? And typically with informants, they don't know who else is informing, right? And so they're all gathering information on one another, but it's James's file that sticks. This is a document from CLR James's MI5 file. I'm showing it to you here because it's information that was collected by an informant on the boat James took when he was deported, right? MI5 were right there. They were not waiting him to show up at Portsmouth or wherever he was landing, Southampton, wherever he was landing in England. They were there on the SS Italia, was the name of the boat, right when it left the docks in New York. Um, The report is is humorous for all kinds of reasons. They say, eh, unlike the FBI, he's got a lot of books. (laughs) Nothing of interest. A lot of books of a left-wing nature Nothing to take special note of. He's tall, he's very handsome, he's very well-dressed, he's extremely articulate and well-spoken. A special search of his baggage was made, but apart from showing he read books of a pro-left-wing nature, nothing of particular interest was revealed. Wears horn rim glasses, very well-spoken, natty suit of good appearance. One of the interesting things that I found as I delved more into CLR James's MI5 file as well as Doris Lessing's MI5 file 
is that there are some subtle but key differences between the kind of intelligence operations that were conducted by the FBI in the US and MI5 in the UK. Um, in the US, the intelligence operations were pretty zealous in prosecuting writers of color, deporting them if possible, putting other constraints on them if that was not possible. In the United Kingdom, there was a slightly different dynamic because of its relation to the decolonizing world, right? And the, the argument that I make in the second half of the book is that there were subtle but meaningful differences between the way that MI5 conducted its intelligence operations and the FBI. MI5 were happy to keep people like CLR James and Doris Lessing and George Padmore and all of the other anti-colonial agitators in London and away from colonial space. When Doris Lessing went to Rhodesia, her home, as it was then known, she was tailed every second of the way. When she tried to go to South Africa, put her on a plane back to Rhodesia. When Claudia Jones was in jail, discussing what she was going to do in response to the deportation notice that she knew was going to be served on her, an ambassador, not the ambassador, but someone from the diplomatic office from the UK came to visit her and told her, you have a UK passport. Legally, you're allowed to go anywhere in the United Kingdom and its dependencies, but you are not welcome in Trinidad. You come to London if you want to, that is just fine by us. You go to Trinidad, we will make trouble for you. And it was the same for CLR James. He could go shout his mouth off at Hyde Park Corner every Sunday morning all he wanted to. But go back to colonial territories and you are going to run into problems. That was one of the key differences between what the FBI and MI5 were doing. So I'm going to end my presentation there. I hope I've given you a sense of the project as a whole. I'm happy to take any questions, and I want to thank you for joining me. I think if anybody does have a question, we're going to get them up at the microphone, which is in the center aisle. Can I be with a question? Be my guest, please. So thank you for a really interesting and stimulating talk. Um, I want to ask a question about your first claim. And what I'm interested in is, this idea that these writers and intellectuals are using funding streams and sources of support from both Cold War blocs. Yeah. But then I'm also interested in, in what you say about the relationship between their opportunism versus, versus you know, the fact that they're all part of a decolonizing world and they're all involved in intellectual discourses about decolonization, revolution, liberation. So to what extent are they intentionally taking advantage of those funding streams and sources of support to, to sustain activities and ideas that they're already involved in versus, you know, taking opportunities that are, you know, like me getting a freelance writing contract that's really, you know, sort of related to what I do, but maybe not my main interest, but hey, it's going to pay the bills and give me an opportunity to advance my, my name. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, one of the things that I'll say is that my belief is that many of the writers who accepted opportunities were doing that partly for professional reasons, right? Um, in the Soviet Union in particular, they had a massive, massive translation scheme, right? I, I mentioned briefly that Lotus Magazine was published in three languages, right? And this was of huge importance for um, writers in the decolonizing world to, to feel like their work could reach audiences in multiple languages. And usually, not always, but often, for writers publishing in Lotus 
this was a gateway to the wider Soviet market. Um, the Soviet Union had by far, and is not even close, the world's largest translation system. So exploiting opportunities with these different cultural diplomacy agencies led to other kinds of professional opportunities. But I want to, I guess, complicate that by saying that many of these writers also took an opportunity to accept outside support to build up what they saw as indigenous cultural institutions that would serve their own needs and their own, their own purposes. So my sense is that relatively few writers said, all right, I'm just going to write this thing to satisfy you know, my readers in the Soviet Union or my readers in the United States, but I have no real investment in it. Um, and part of the reason I think that is because writers can be very stubborn and in incredibly bad at taking directions from anyone. It's, it's, it's hard for me, and this may be looking at things in retrospect, it's hard for me to imagine Vole Shoyinka, you know, like writing on peace. Like, that guy writes what he wants to write and says what he wants to say to the people he wants to say, it, and he, 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 is, he is not worried about what you will think. Um, and that, at times, that cost him very dearly, right? He spent a couple years in jail, much of it in solitary confinement, um, he almost died during that time because he believed in what he wanted to say. So, you know, I, when I say that it's hard to tell those writers um, what to say, I, I may have sounded somewhat flippant, but I, I take that very, very seriously. Some of these writers learned at great, great personal cost that saying what you like can get you into some some very serious trouble. So thank you for that question. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Very interesting. Um, my question, I think, begins with Angela Davis. And so she visits the Soviet Union, I think, in 1975. And she goes to Tashkent in part to sort of celebrate the non-whiteness of yeah. the Soviet Union. And I know from the Soviet angle, they loved the, the, the racial strife that the United States was going through in the 1960s, right? Yep, absolutely. So they welcomed the Black Panthers, they welcomed the race riots, because this was sort of capitalism and its death throes, right? And so I'm wondering if there was a uh, sort of an equal but opposite response of the United States trying to foment racial resentment with in the Soviet Union. Oh, great question. And so and anywhere in your research, did you see the CIA trying to engage groups in Central Asia? Um, I don't know. I think it's something that we, that kind of gets lost in this whole debate is how multi-ethnic the Soviet Union in fact is throughout yeah. the Cold War. So th that's a great question. It did not come up a lot in my research. Um, and it's partly because um, the CIA records that are available to us, um, and the CIA releases nothing to anyone, right? Um, the CIA records that are available to us in the context of my research have to do with the quirks of the Congress for Cultural Freedom and the way it was established. So the, the I hope this doesn't get too technical, this answer, but so the CIA set up basically a fake 503, it's C, I think is what it is, right? That's a nonprofit 503C, right? Okay, so they set up a fake 503C um, to uh, do all of the business for the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Um, they funded it secretly, but for all, even for tax purposes in the U.S., it looked like a legitimate nonprofit. And so when the CIA wound up operations, they just stopped giving money. But it's not like they went into the offices and raided the paperwork and took it back. And so somebody at some point said, oh, we got all these papers around. Let's, let's find a home for them. And they ended up at the University of Chicago um, in the special collection. So that's how we can see the Congress for Cultural Freedom stuff. Now, what I will say is that you don't see in those particular documents a lot of interest in the U.S. trying to drum up racial or even better religious strife in the Soviet Union, right? Um, 
The Soviet Union were using Central Asian writers as their kind of trump card in this cultural warfare, right? In the U.S., um, there were significant problems with um, the public perception of racism and racial equality overseas, right? And the Soviet Union made sure that that was in front of writers in the decolonizing world every time. So they would bring... They brought Audre Lorde to one of these events. She's got a great essay about it that I talk about in the book. They would, you know, they would bring Angela Davis. They would bring bring W.E.B. Du Bois for the very first one of these events. And they would say to them, like, look, people of color are an equal part of the Soviet project, right? That was a big part of their PR. Now, on the flip side... The Congress for Cultural Freedom was always on the back foot on the question of racial discrimination in the U.S. So when the Congress for Cultural Freedom would go on their roadshow in Asia and in Africa, people would say, yeah, you know, how do you treat people who look like me in your country, right? That was always the major problem. So they did some interesting things. They were a huge supporter of people like Eskia Mpalele and Luz Nkosi and Alex Laguma. These were all people who had serious, serious problems and eventually became exiles from South Africa. So it's interesting, right? In the U.S. geopolitically was aligned, quietly, but nevertheless aligned firmly with South Africa, right? But in terms of their cultural diplomacy... They say very explicitly, our job is to condemn what is happening in South Africa. So you see these two different arms of the United States government working essentially at cross purposes because the people in the Congress for Cultural Freedom, they had a significant degree of latitude and autonomy and they said, you know, the U.S. line is not going to (laughs) work. If we take this position on South Africa... We're sunk. We have no chance here. And so they, the the Congress for Cultural Freedom in their African activities condemned in the strongest possible terms everything that was happening in apartheid South Africa. And make no mistake, the U.S. and Soviet Union, they had spies at one another's cultural diplomacy events. There's a, there, there, are some, there are some documents I found about that. They're, they're checking out what, what the other guys, what the competition is doing. This is just really wonderful, fascinating. And I'm wondering if you have, in this study, if it's sort of given you the opportunity, if you've taken the opportunity to sort of reflect on the legacies, the, the legacy of this mechanism, right, and its sort of um, contemporary iteration, if that is, you know, something that you've yeah. sort of thought through. You know, the thing that comes to mind is what I... Aikwe Arma says about the publishing industries, for example, in Penguin and so forth. And, and, and sort of that's one angle. But whether institutional or otherwise, I'm wondering if you've thought much about its sort of contemporary iterations or the legacy of that mechanism. Yeah, so let me, I'm going to spin that question, which is an excellent question, slightly. In 1967, there's a huge change, right? Because the CIA is unmasked as the supporter of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. That's a key moment, right, in this, um, in this story that I tell. And then, of course, 1990, fall of the Berlin Wall, end of the Soviet Union, is another key, key moment because Soviet interest and, you know, you could say Russian interest in supporting this kind of work in the decolonizing world, it stops completely, What you have, I think, in the contemporary moment is a really interesting resurgence of cultural diplomacy, not through literature, but through sports, right? If you see the way that large states are trying to establish legitimacy, it is no longer primarily through books, magazines, international conferences that gather together intellectuals, right? But it is with major state investments in sports to try to 
make leg- regimes seem more legitimate in the in in the international community. Um, sports has always been a part of that, right? Germany hosted the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, but now the level of investment in sports in particular, it's analogous to, it's similar to the kinds of investments in arts and culture during this period, but it's happening and appealing to a very different group of people, right? Because the global audiences for sport are far, far vaster than they ever were for the kind of books and magazines that we're talking about here. So great question. Thank you for that. Um, That is all that we have time for today. So I want to thank you so much for joining me here today. It was a real pleasure talking with you about my work. Thanks for listening to this week's Lectures in History podcast. To find even more history content, visit c-span.org slash ahtv.